Okay. Have we got Martin? Shout out to Martin. I don't know if he's in the house at the moment. He's just received some not nice news, so. Oh. Yeah. Okay. He'll be back. <laughs> sure. Shall we? Nothing uh... drastic. Nothing drastic. <laughs> okay. Um, should we roll on? Shall we? Well, he's not in the house. Kaz is in the house. So at least we got one of the Kerns. Um, good afternoon, everyone. You are attending Scrum Australia online lightning talks, session number two. Um, we are delighted to bring you this session using the beautiful technology of Cisco WebEx um, supplied to you today by our friends at Telstra. And unashamedly, I do work for Telstra and I've got a lot of my colleagues here today. Um, let me apologise, my connections are not terribly well, so you probably can't see my face. And I can't see your face either. But let's not let technology ruin our day. Um, we're here to um, connect and learn uh, and listen to some great speakers this afternoon. Um, without uh, me going any further, can I give a shout out to Jared? Is he in the call? Jared, are you there? I yep, I'm in the call. I would like you to come up uh, to the digital stage and do our welcome to country. Thank you. Thank you very much. And thank you, everyone. I'd like to begin with the acknowledgement of country. In the spirit of reconciliation, Scrum Australia acknowledges the traditional custodians of country throughout Australia and their connections to land, sea, and community. We pay our respects to the elders past and present and extend that respect to all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples today. Hi everyone, my name is Charity Gallagher. I'm a proud Irander, literature, and Waramanga man. I'm also a software developer for Gairo Infotech. Today is Global Accessibility Awareness Day, and it's given me a chance to reflect on my personal experiences and the importance of digital accessibility. I find it common for developers to make something which is clear to them and easy to use, but difficult for others. And as a developer, it's crucial to keep people at the forefront of software development. After all, I tell myself I'm making software for people to use. Coming from Alice Springs, I'm well aware of the difficulties that members of the Aboriginal community have while interacting with different systems. In many situations, people may have English as a second language, low literacy or lower English skills. Difficulties with digital interfaces are compounded by confusing and unintuitive designs. I'm also aware of the struggles with digital accessibility within the disability community, specifically people with autism or Down syndrome. And I found that it's crucial to understand the needs of a user group to make something that provides a good user experience for everyone. It can be difficult to create a perfect user experience for everyone. And in my experience, accessibility isn't just an on-off toggle, but a conscious and thoughtful approach to putting people at the center of design. Thank you. Well said, Jared, you couldn't put it any better. I think uh, I'll be redundant by next uh, session. I'm gonna like you to be the host and MC. Now, by the way, my name is Fred Lee Trant and I'd like you to, um, I formally I welcome you to this session again. Um, today has been without, I guess, with all the great work behind the scene, um, we are bringing you closed caption. And if I could have Dave Bell to maybe take some instructions through, if you've done it already, I'm happy to bypass that. But Dave, you want to give a few words of how to, to access the closed caption today's session? Yeah, sure. Uh, so thanks, Fred. Um, now there's two ways. You can use the um, WebEx Assistant um, captions, which we've got automatically turned on for everyone. Um, plus we also have um, our friends at AO Media who have got a um, live caption set up for us. So um, David, I believe we've got that link dropped in the chat. And so if you wish to um, take part in the session that way, feel free to open that link and make use of that service. Um, so hopefully that's good for everyone um, and we're good to go. Um, Brady, I, I think I've got it, but do you wish to add anything there in terms of how we can make this accessible? No, that's great. Thanks, Abe. Um, yeah, so just a reminder, the, the link is for a separate streaming closed caption to open it up in a different window. 
or the bottom left corner closed caption logo will will give you the native Cisco uh, WebEx closed captions on the screen, which you can move around and adjust font size um, for either either of them to make it easier for you. Thank you. So obviously um, on accessibility day today, it's wonderful to have our software also enabling us to connect um, with everyone. So thank, thank you. you, Dave, and thank you, uh, Brady. We have a packed agenda, and I will try to um, navigate and make you feel um, informative, uh, engaging, and connecting to our peers today. So um, currently, we're sitting at 51 participants. So a shout out to all those far and wide in our great land. I wonder if we've got anyone from overseas um, who would like to welcome them as well. Um, now, uh, with I said, with the, the great uh, agenda today, um, I would like to invite Martin to say a few words on behalf of Scrum Australia with any user updates. But Karen, is he in the house yet? Or should I just skip that? Martin? Skip it. I don't board? know where he oh, is. Skip it. <laughs> okay. All right. Well, I'm going to say that on behalf of Scrum Australia, welcome everyone and he can come up and give you a bit of a news update and any announcement later on. Let's kick this off, right? We have a three amazing topics and we have a group of amazing people to share with those of you today. The first one we have is um, to come to share with you is a fantastic speaker, Mia Horrigan. Mia is a founder of ZEM, I will not try to pronounce the whole name, but her company has been a fantastic friend of Scrum Australia over many years. She is a partner for enterprise strategy and agility. She is an experienced enterprise agile coach and a senior program manager with over 15 years of um, coaching senior executives, um, leading and implementing large program of work. She comes with you um, as a, you know, a regular speaker at Scrum Australia conferences, and her topic today will be stopping setting up projects and start moving to a product-based operating model. Would you like to welcome Mia to the digital stage? Over to you, Mia. Hi, and I'll just get Dave to share the screen with me so that I can, oh, thank you very much. And, and while we're getting set up, please use the okay. um, chat to ask questions and I'm sure Mia will also take questions during her um, talk and at the end. Right. You, so hopefully you can all see my um, screen now. So yeah, um, thank you for the opportunity to talk to you today about um, setting up product-based operating models rather than just setting up projects. And what sort of inspired me um, with this talk today, knowing that it's um, Global Disability and Awareness Day is, um, for those of you that don't know me that well, on the weekends, I'm actually a blind guide for the Achilles Running Club. So this is an international club and you'll often see us in the park runs across all of Australia. Um, and if you see us in the yellow shirts, uh, we're helping to guide um, the blind runners. So here, my the main three runners and athletes that I work with are um, John, Leone and Peter. And in talking to them, as you can imagine, over a 5K run, we talk about a lot of things to do with accessibility and disability, and they're always interested in what I'm doing in IT and, and particularly as an Agile coach. So when I was thinking about this talk and about setting up projects after projects and not really thinking about um, the humans that are going to be working in those systems, it, I often think about the things that Leone and John and Peter have taught me as a blind guide. And essentially, when we're thinking about, particularly from an Agile perspective and as Agile coaches um, working with leadership, often we um, need to think more about the whole system. And in particular, the people, the human side of those systems and how that contributes to it. And often sometimes when you're setting up new organisational change, that can get lost, that human side of the system. Often we get a funding idea, that's great, and we set up those project teams around it. Um, as Agilists, we know that that doesn't really help us um, solve the problems. We, we maintain those silo structures, the governance is still at the apex, 
and the decisions are flowing down from that hierarchy as a result. And when the project's finished, it's disbanded. So I was recently working with a large wholesale retail group and they wanted to move to an agile way and, and transform their organisation. And we started first looking at what's the best operating model for us to think about to do such a big change across their organisation. We knew that we wanted to go in an agile way um, because we knew that the traditional way that they were um, looking at projects just really wasn't working with them. They're an ASX listed company, they have a board, um, and they had a lot of things that just didn't land over the last couple of years. So they were really open to looking at new ways of working. So when we talk to them about thinking about things from an agile product management perspective rather than a project management perspective, it was really talking to them through that whole life cycle and that whole system of everything from their ideation all the way through to their customer feedback and matrix and all those things in between. We highlighted that when we're just setting up projects as opposed to looking at a product view and an operating model to support that product view, if we're just looking at project often, the focus is really on that pink box. It's the, you know, the mechanics of the writing, the user stories, but we're still looking at fixed milestones and deliverables. And we're not thinking about the end to end and how, what it really takes from the business, as well as the IT, if it's a systems change, um, to deliver these products. We want to look at it from the product lens, because when we look at it from the product lens, it's the whole, um, the whole area about how do we make this valuable for customers? So what are the human people that we are developing this for? But then we also wanted to look at the operating model of the humans within our system that would be delivering this change. So we looked at um, understanding that we actually needed a network of teams. This is a large organisation um, and, you know, obviously they have their organisational structure of how they work, but we were looking at um, implementing a framework for Scrum at scale. And so we had to think about, well, what is that um, team and network of teams of how the work will actually get done? because we knew that the hierarchy would give them the structure, but hierarchy actually makes it slow to make decisions. So we wanted that operating model to really be able to make those fast decisions that they needed to make, get those feedback um, and align to their, their vision and have a single prioritised um, backlog focused on products. So that that way we weren't just setting up teams and disbanding them, we actually had the whole system worth thinking about. And we knew that this would be more valuable. It would bring business and IT um, and the whole organisation closer together because we'd be planning, committing and executing together. So this was where we came up with moving from that project to a product based model that was really going to look at the operational side of things because we wanted this to be an enterprise um, change not just a change in a particular area. Just really link that strategy of what the board needed to achieve um, to that detailed organisational design. So why a new operating model? Um, they were growing rapidly and the model that they currently had just wasn't really meeting their business needs or supporting their people. Um, they wanted to create that culture that really was aligned to their values. They also wanted to make sure they were being manageable um, workload. They wanted something that could scale and they also had a lot of bottlenecks in their systems which a lot of you would be familiar with where you've got dependencies on specialist expertise in particular pockets of, of your businesses. Um, they wanted to promote self-organisation and removing those silos that were there in the organisation. They wanted their people to have those clear expectations on what was expected, what were the behaviours that they need to align to and what that also aligned to their values. And they also wanted to make sure that they kept good people and um, recruited and brought in good people with the right skills and capabilities um, to really achieve what they wanted to do in their growth targets. Um, the operating model uh, was obviously looking at how do we cut, get that combination of that talent, that processes and capability um, to look at how the organisation works and how the people work together. So it was that vital link from the company strategy to the organisational design that they were, they were missing. And that's where we came in to help them with that. 
so that everything was aligned to help support um, the strategic priorities. The operating model we came up with, obviously we looked at the strategy and design and organisational design areas. So from strategy and design, we looked at the strategic elements, the drivers of value, where do they want to play, the customer experience, the product ecosystem, um, how they want to win, how they think about that product life cycle, and the cultures and values that they really wanted to, um, to have in their strategy and design. From the organisational design, we need to look at the structure and how decisions were made. We needed to make sure we got that clarity on priorities, um, really looking at people, processes, technology, those talent requirements, how the information flows, what sort of feedback loops and metrics and the cultural dimensions that were going beyond just communicating the values to actually being explicit about the behaviours, because it was really a behavioural change that we needed across the organisation for this to happen. So the operating model that we came up with looked at the structure and the boundaries um, for how we were going to deliver those um, services and uh, leverage that at scale. Definitely defining the accountabilities, particularly within an agile framework and how that self-organisation would work. Uh, the talent and capabilities, um, combining those people and processes and technology together. Another thing that was really important was because they were moving from a project-based model where a lot of it was about the governance and there's reporting to the board um, and committees that is still so very important, we had to look at how that operating model would help that. Um, we've also uh, wanted to look at the ways of working. So um, rather than calling it um, agile, ways of working was um, the way that we want to talk about how we collaborated together. And we also wanted to look at the metrics so we could have strict, clear um, traceability from those strategic objectives to the priorities in the products um, that were being delivered. Obviously, um, the framework that we used uh, to scale this across the different teams was actually looking at Scrum at scale. We felt that this would be equally applicable in a business setting um, as well as an IT setting to all work together on that. And what we were trying to do was really get that lean, agile enterprise happening. So looking at the strategic drivers, the outcomes, the investments that they need to make, um, what's then going to be their tactical objectives and how do they deliver that. So that way um, you could see the clear line of sight from your organisational goals to through to the strategic goal, the strategic initiative you're working on, then the products and the teams and their sprint level activities. And that was that transparency and visibility that they just didn't have at the time. Um, we also needed to show that the system would all come together and that the guide rails and, or guardrails that the management um, at the executive level had in place um, could still work in that agile environment. So we, we talked about the government forums. So rather than fighting against uh, the different uh, governance that they had, we showed how in this new way of operating, those governance forums and those um, guardrails that they wanted in place could still happen on that um, sort of daily basis with our teams um, and in their sprints on a two week basis to that program level looking at the products to that governance for the executive leadership and C-suite that really were providing that vision goals um, every three months. So how did that work from the operational point of view? Um, from the governance point of view, we're managing um, the leadership initiatives through the executive backlog. So they had their own backlog and that had the strategic goals, their objectives, the operational changes and the strategic roadmap. We managed the organisational change through that program backlog. And this had a mix of the so-called project work um, and the BAU work that needed to be done. From that, we then had our um, Teams product backlogs that were looking at um, their combination of teamwork, sprint work, BAU, capability developments and their improvements. And then from the other piece of the governance was the product owners who are looking at the value and prioritising the work at that level and making it clear that they had accountability for that, that the scrum masters understood their boundaries of where self-organisation landed um, and that in, where we needed to escalate we had the concept, um, because it was Scrum at scale, of this Chief Scrum Master 
um, for those um, escalations. And then we thought about the capability. So how the people, because um, a lot of the uh, group were very concerned because most of their careers they'd spent um, knowing that I, for example, I, you know, I start as a BA, then I become a senior BA, then I might become a project manager and I might become a team lead and I go through um, career path that way. Whereas with Agile, it looked very flat and it is very flat um, to everybody. So people wanted to understand, well, how do I still um, progress in my career here, but also how do I hone my skills in my specialist area? Because they, they didn't want to lose that. They were open to picking up new co capabilities in cross-skilling, but they also wanted to get a support mechanism of how do we support people wanting to develop those new capabilities and how do we leverage off the senior SMEs that we already have in those capabilities. So the community practices um, uh, were set up to look at those and we had leads for those but they weren't necessarily um, from a management layer per se. Um, they all came from within the teams themselves because we had this concept that we didn't want our quarterbacks on the bench. We wanted our really specialist people um, who were actually in there working with the teams day to day, but they also had this additional hat of looking after that particular capability. Um, the continuous improvement was big part of everybody's backlog. So the teams, um, made sure that they put those actions into their backlogs and the PO aligned those improvements to the operational investments that were being made. And if there were any escalations that needed to happen um, on the improvements, that was also visible in the executive leaders um, program backlog as well. And we established the definition of done consistently um, from the organisation point of view. Uh, for those quality standards and the capability leads were, were integral in that. It didn't mean that teams couldn't add to the definition of done, but we just had a common understanding of what um, the quality standards were across that whole product grouping. So that clear structures, that roles really helped. Um, and we looked at, uh, we called them guilds, the capability um, leads from each of those. And we felt that we, whilst we were doing Scrum at scale, um, a lot of the other scaling frameworks use a, a very, very similar pattern. So um, we had lots of people from the organisation who'd come from different frameworks and philosophies, um, and they were able to um, clearly understand the different roles by, by using this framework and um, making that uh, clear what, um, what the capability leads would be doing. We also looked at team blueprints because there was a lot of um, what's the best way to do this. So the capability types were the kind of mix of skills that we needed, but people wanted to understand what kind of work types go into their product backlog. So we did a lot of blueprints for them. Um, this one that I'm showing you obviously is the IT team and it's looking at you know the solution, the hypothesis, their user feedback, but also their BAU activities and talking about the framework um, that they'd be delivering that. When we uh, started working with the business side as well, um, we started to do a similar blueprint for them. So this is an example of the procurement blueprint we put together. So obviously they're looking at procurement, contracts, um, vendor communication, legal, um, very, very different work types they're doing. So obviously the capabilities that needed to be developed there were very different as well. More contract management, product management was in here, risk management and lean. HR teams, uh, we looked at their work types and again, their capability types and so forth through all the different business teams to get them comfortable. Um, the marketing team, that was a really interesting one because there's a lot happening in social media and it changes um, daily. Um, that was a very vibrant team and they obviously need a mix of skills and they were probably one of the first groups to really embrace um, this way of working. Um, in the marketing space. So it was a really good example of, of where it was truly humming in a, in a business point of view. Uh, we had a lot of um, working with the teams, looking at their skills and capabilities and mapping what their different skills are and what they brought to the table and what sort of things they like to do versus things they were good at, but they don't really like to do them and stuff that they just weren't interested. In. And that helped us um, identify where we could pair, where we could have leads on different things where we needed um, some capability building and so forth. So each of the teams kind of did that blueprint as well. 
so I know that I'm nearly out of time. So um, yeah, so we really, when we're bringing together that model, we really thought more about the behaviours and how the people interact. Um, and we felt that these um, four primary behaviours were the real key to um, achieving their aims operationally of getting faster to market, um, lowering the costs and lowering their risks. So the things that we really focused on in that operating model um, and the maturity assessments that we did were self-organisation, agile values, um, the sprinting, the mechanics of, of how the process worked, but also that building that continuous learning culture. And we measured that in a tool called Agile IQ. So in conclusion, look, we just found that just setting up project teams just wasn't really working for them because of what it, when you, when you just set up projects, you're only changing it at the team level. The rest of the organisation is still operating in the traditional way. Um, to really change the whole system, you need that top down as well as bottom up approach and also that sideways approach to bring that management layer along with you. So uh, much like what the Gartner research is, is talking about over the last couple of years, um, most of the CEOs and CIOs are looking at moving to product based models because they know from an operational perspective that's actually going to help them as a modern organisation really be able to deliver um, their strategy. And at the heart of that system, building any operational model, you really need to think about the people and the network of how the people will work together. And that's where you can truly take an organisation from pockets of doing it well to truly an enterprise agility where this just becomes their way of working. Um, so uh, it's very passionate for us about working and thinking about humans because at ZXM we set ourselves a big target of trying to help improve the working lives of over a million people um, by 2025. Um, if you want to contact me, I've put my um, details down there, but there's lots of um, things on our blog. Um, just setting yourself big, big goals. Um, go back to um, John, Leone and Peter. They've actually set themselves a goal of the Hawaii Marathon in December 2022. The reason for Hawaii is they don't have a time limit on finishing the 42 Ks. So there's um, four, coach, uh, four um, guides that go with each of our athletes over there. So that's our big goal that we've set us and um, when you're thinking about developing human systems, accessibility, um, and who you're developing this for, um, you probably have those inspirational people in your organisation or your network. Um, you know, these are the people that I think about when I'm thinking about those things too. Um, thank so you thank very you very much. much for letting me share. Yeah. Thank you very much, Mia. A virtual round of applause to our, um, our speaker. Thank you, everyone. Um, if I could add, Mia, if you do end up in Hawaii in 2022 as a small <laughs> reward for the finishing the uh, marathon, I'd like you to go and taste rolled ice cream on the beaches of Waikiki. Oh, That's a tip. I will look forward to that. that. Apparently, and if you can share guide, me an the Instagram marathon. picture. Yeah. yeah, apparently as a guide, it still counts that I did the marathon. And that's what no, I'm holding on to. Uh, uh, so. Whether you do it so or not, cool. if you land up, if you get a chance to go over there, everybody, rolled ice cream. It is to die for. Rolled ice cream. Okay. Thank questions you very much. for me. Yeah, any questions from me, please? We've got a couple of minutes, maybe one or two questions, and whoever wants to ask Mia. Stop sharing and give control back to Dave. There we go. Okay. Raise your hand, digital, or you want to just. Speak out or type it in. Old ice it. cream. Dave, can you? Okay. Anchor asked a question in the chat. Oh, okay. Yeah, Hanker, would you like to come on and ask it, or would you like us to read it out? Okay, we can read that for you, Hanker. So. Mia, what is the success criteria or metric to measure if this product-based delivery ops model work from time to time? Yeah, so the metrics that we really concentrated on was the time to market um, and because uh, that was the biggest problem that they were having um, and also the feedback from users. Um, obviously, their market share would obviously go up if they had happy users, so we did obviously look at um, their market share price. But uh, from the user's point of view, we had a, 
a big project and I don't want to sort of name it too much, but they spent $2 million um, on a particular uh, small project. They showed it to um, people at the end of it, actually, sorry, $20 million. They showed it to people at the end of it and they're going, yeah, but that won't fit. We wouldn't use that. So they had forgotten about that user side of things. So having that product and that user side. So it was going to be, um, did we get things busted to market? Did we bring our users along on that journey? And did we end up with uh, a better value outcome that our users actually wanted, which ultimately translated into our share price keeps going up? Um, because they're in retail, their share price went up anyway because of COVID, because they're in the food, liquor and hardware business. Um, so it probably wasn't a fair measure in COVID times, but that was certainly the, the measure that we set at the beginning of the journey. I'm just tempted, I'm tempted to, to call out that name, but I won't I'll reserve that. But thank you, Mia. Um, the call out for us is to start thinking about setting our project or moving away from, uh, from a typical traditional project into a much more product-based operating model. So all that beautiful insights Let's move along to our next speaker that we have scheduled this afternoon. And I would like to introduce to you Melanie Harrington. Melinda Harrington, I should say. Melinda is a self-described Agilist Scrum Master and Agile Coach. She began her project management career creating award-winning software for children with disabilities and passionate belief that we can always improve the way we work. She reinforced this by regularly volunteering and by being a support worker. She currently works as an agile coach in high up product team. Melinda has presented at Scrum Australia before in 2017 and it is a pleasure to welcome her back. She will be presenting to you a topic called choice and control how high up empowering vision aligns with agile principle driven culture. So I would like to welcome Melinda to the digital stage. Welcome, Melinda. Hi, thank you. Um, and thanks Mia for that great presentation. Love the way you started with the humans. Um, it's been great. Okay, and also Dave's gonna help with the slides. So we'll see how that goes. Um, we can just move on to number two. Excellent. Okay, so I'm going to ask everybody to use the chat feature during this lightning talk. So um, I have actually just learned that you can actually make the chat a bit bigger, um, which helps because the screen is quite small. So you can you can drag it. I won't be able to tell if you did that or not. But what I can tell is I'm going to ask you just to practice if you could put your name in the chat, put your name in the chat and then hit return just to practice and make sure that everybody has figured out how to use the chat because we're gonna use it a lot. Yay, we got a couple of them hanging there. Okay, that's great. Terrific. Awesome. Cool, cool. We're getting them, um, yeah, we're getting that, great. Um, yeah, and we'll get copies of the slides out to you afterwards um, as well, because I know people have been asking for that. Okay, um, we can move on to the next slide, please. Okay, so the takeaways that I want you to get from this, there's three. Um, I'd like you to, first of all, understand what it is that higher up does. Um, I'd like you to understand some of the principles of the NDIS and then to explore how higher up the NDIS and adult principles align. Okay, on to the next one. Okay. So I'll get back to higher up in a minute, but first of all, I'm just going to talk about startups in general. So. One of the things that you might have noticed is when startups kind of come on the scene and you don't know what it is that they do, we'll usually get a bit of an analogy. So it'll be something like WAG is like Uber, but for dogs. I don't know what that is at all. That's just must be your screen. It's all good. Okay, WAG is like Uber, but for dogs. So just to be clear, in this case, the dogs aren't driving, okay? It's an app for dog walkers. But what makes it similar to Uber is that dog owners can book dog walkers to the app and pick the walker who is the closest to them. Okay, next slide. So we are now going to play a game and the game is called Startup Mashup. And what I want you to do in the chat window, don't do this yet, is to brainstorm the weirdest, coolest, most entertaining, crazy example of a fake startup, okay? And it's gonna be something like, WAG is like Uber, but for dogs, but something even more creative than that. 
But there's one other little piece of information that I want to tell you is don't hit return because you don't want to give away your idea. Okay. So type it and then hold for a second. Okay. Um, I can't see you all, so I'm just going to have to guess when you're kind of done. But everybody type a super creative idea for a startup that's like crazy. Okay. And I'll give you a few seconds to do that. Okay, I hope they're there. Hit return, and now we should see a whole bunch of them. Or two. Keep going, keep going. Ooh. Trying to swim in someone else's pool. Ah. I'd actually use that. Functional dogware. Okay, we have an alien Uber service for dinner delivery. Date, cheese, and wine. Very nice. Functional dogware. Machine learning to decide what to eat. Oh my gosh. So there really is a pool thing in New York City. Okay, cool. So what we're going to, a one foot shoe shop. Yeah, okay. Um, rent karaoke night equipment. Nice. Cool. So if, create your own emoji. I like that. Okay, so if everybody has done it, what we're going to do is you're going to vote for the one that you like. So just type in, it can't be yours, type in someone else's that you think was really cool. So everybody can just have a vote for, for the idea that was the coolest. Okay, we got one vote for create your own emoji. Need more voters. Yep, create your own swimming pool, one foot shoe shop, functional dog wear, we're in a swim, we're at karaoke night. Create your own emoji, one foot shoe shop. And learning to decide what to eat. Learn to swim. Okay, this is very scientific because it's really hard to count. Um, rent to swim and create your own emoji. Well, let's just let's just go with rent to swim and create your own emoji. Huge apologies if you weren't actually the winners, but moving on to the next slide. Um, let's give them a round of applause. That can be virtual if it needs it to be. And the really cool thing. For the winners is you get eight story points. Okay, eight story points that you can use however you want. Okay, so yay for the winners of that round. Okay, moving on to the next slide. Okay, so higher up is an is a real startup. Okay, we're an NDIS registered online platform for people with disability to find, hire, and manage support workers who fit their needs and share their interest. Okay, so we're going on to the next slide because I'm going to give you another challenge. So this is a real one in the chat window. Can you tell me what higher up is like? So higher up is like blank for blank. So what's the analogy for what it is that higher up does that you can come up with? Everyone in the chat window. And you can go ahead and hit return. You don't have to wait so you can do. Higher up is like blank. There we go. Flexibility for choice of a support work. Cool. Tinder. Great. Thanks, Catherine. Airtasker. Okay. <laughs> Another vote for Airtasker. Okay, cool. Support for the individual. Cool. And one stop shop for the public. Airtasker. Okay, we got a lot of Airtasker likers. Okay, which is pretty cool. Um, if we could move on to the next slide. Okay, so yeah, mostly we're in the Airtasker world. There is, which is great, um, but there's a super critical distinction. So I'm gonna give that away if we can just move on to the next slide, what the super critical distinction is. So the big distinction is that at higher up, our support workers are actually employees. So a lot of the times when people talk about analogies for what higher up does, we tend to go to the gig economy, which absolutely makes sense because from a platform perspective, we're like that. But the one fundamental difference is that support workers are actually employees and they're not um, contractors. So that means that um, we can, that the higher up people follow the disability services industrial reward. And that means that support workers get all of the protections that employees get. So our support workers are treated better because they're actually employees as opposed to people in the gig economy. So yes, De Stephanie just got it. Menulog has very recently um, made a change like that where they've said, we wanna treat people as employees or hire people as employees as, a as opposed to contractors. So it's very similar to um, 
what um, Menulog has just done. Um, higher ups been like that from the ground up. We've always had our support workers being employees. Okay, next question, next slide as well. What does this have to do with Agile? Okay, I will get to it, but first we're gonna play another game, okay? Next slide. The game we are gonna play is called JavaScript or 90s boy band, okay? And it's a really quick game, but you're gonna have to be in your chat windows again. The way that this game works is I'm gonna put, well, actually Dave is gonna put up a word or phrase, and you're gonna have to guess whether it's related to JavaScript or a 90s boy band, okay? Don't Google, and if you get it right, keep track because we wanna know who wins, okay? So Dave, show us the question. NSYNC, okay? So in the chat, tell us, is NSYNC JavaScript or a boy band? Okay, I think we're ready for the answer, Dave. It's a boy band, yay! So if you got that right, give yourself a point, okay? And keep track, because there's no way I can keep track of all of these. All right, we're on to number two. Enyo, is this JavaScript or 90s boy band? Cleaning product? Yeah, I think it might be. <laughs> okay, all right, let's reveal it. What is it? It's a JavaScript framework. Okay, give yourself a point if you got that right. Now, the third and final one is C Note. JavaScript or 90s boy band? <laughs> All right, extra credit for the $100 bill. Let's see what the answer is. It's a 90s boy band. Woohoo! Okay, so who got all three right? Just tell us in the chat if you got all three right. Don't be shy. Two out of three? Yeah, cool. That's pretty good. Anyone get three out of three? Fun quiz. Ah, Jeremy, winner. Winner. Okay. So, yeah, Jeremy gets three story points. And anyone else, even if you didn't tell me that you got all three right, um, we can move on to the next slide. Um, the winner is definitely Jeremy, and there's probably some quiet people in there as well who get story points. Three story points to everybody. Hey, two. You can have two story points if you got two right. And, in fact, I'll even give you one if you got one right, okay? Okay, cool, we're moving on to the next one. What is the NDIS? Okay, so of course a lot has been written about the NDIS. Um, what I'm giving you right now is from a podcast called The Nation Change. Um, if you want a great idea of what the um, NDIS is about and the history, that's a great place to start. So let me give you this one. Rather than disability service providers being paid by state governments to support individuals, people would get money from the government directly to spend with the providers that they choose. This was a crucial change. It meant power would rest with the people and not the providers, giving people with disability choice and control, two things they'd never had before. And this is from Bruce, Bruce I don't know how to say his last name, um, and it was being quoted by Kurt Fernley, who's the guy that did the podcast. Okay, on to the next slide. Now we're gonna play the same game, but this one's for real. You're gonna have to guess NDIS or Agile. Okay, NDIS or Agile. So the first question is choice and control. So in the chat, is it NDIS or is it Agile? Okay, we got a couple NDIS. We got some both, mostly NDIS, mostly NDIS. Ooh, and the answer is, yep. NDIS. Okay, so most of you got that. Um, choice and control is one of the goals in the NDIS, and also it was in the slide before, so you're paying attention, which is great. If you got that one right, give yourself a point, keep track. We're going on to number two. Okay, this is a massive, massive cultural change and organizational change. NDIS or Agile in the chat? NDIS or Agile? Well, okay, let's have the answer. NDIS. And I know, yes, of course, we say this all the time about Agile, but this is actually a direct quote from Jenny Macklin, who's an MP. It was a massive, massive cultural change and organizational change. 
Okay, moving on to number three. Adaptation becomes more difficult when the people involved are not empowered or self-managing. NDIS or Agile? Okay, let's see the answer. Agile. This one is actually out of the Scrum Guide. Cool. And number four. Innovation, quality, continuous improvement, contemporary best practice, and effectiveness. Is this Agile or NDIS? Okay, let's see the answer here. NDIS. Yeah, that's right out of the NDIS operational guideline, right? Okay. And number five. The best architectures, requirements, and designs emerge from self-organizing teams. Might have given you an easy one there. Okay, we're seeing a lot of agile. Remember, you have to keep track. Keep track of how many of these you're getting right. Okay, uh, we'll show you the answer. Yes, of course. The best architectures, requirements, and designs emerge from self-organizing teams. It's right out of the Agile Manifesto. I think you all got that one. Number six, dignity of risk. Dignity of risk. Agile or NDIS? Getting good. Okay, I think we can see the answer. Yep, NDIS. The dignity of risk is about respecting the rights of people with disability to assess the risks associated with their decisions and actions. Now we only got two more left, so I hope you're keeping track. Give them the environment and the support they need. NDIS or Agile? Okay, let's call it. And the answer is Agile. Build projects around motivated individuals, give them the environment and support they need, and trust them to get the job done. Okay, this is the very last one. Number eight, make safety a prerequisite. NDIS or Agile? Okay, this is the last one. Let's see it. Yeah, I took it right out of Modern Agile. So it is in fact a, um, yeah, it's from Agile. So, and the winner is, did anybody get eight? Tell me in chat if anybody got eight. Anybody get seven? Anybody get six? Charmaine. So we have two sixes. Round of applause. We will give you, um, it looks like we got Kamal as well. So all three of you, give them everybody a big round of applause. And you are going to get, listen, I, I, you know, oh, you might have it as well. Another step. Let's do it. Um, let's give you 20, 20 story points. Okay. 20 story points for everybody that got six. And, you know, everybody else can have some story points as well. Okay. Cool. Now, next start, slide. That was hard. Okay, so why was it hard? Well, it was hard because the great thing is there's actually quite a bit of consistency across these things. Um, next slide as well. Um, it's hard to figure out which one of these because there are so many analogies that we can actually we can actually draw, you know. So even though I'm giving you credit for the actual source, in most cases they could have very easily fit into either of these sources. So in summary. Okay, first of all, I do hope, next slide, you have a clear understanding of what Higher Up does. So our purpose is to enable the pursuit of a good life for everyone, okay? So that's at Higher Up. And then as also, I think you'll have in the next slide, um, more of an idea of the principles of what the NDIS is and are. NDIS is striving to enable people with disability to exercise choice and control in the pursuit of their goals and the planning and delivery of their supports kind of thing that those of us agilists can really get behind. 
And of course, we have the manifesto and building projects around motivated individuals, give them the environment and support they need and trust them to get the job done. So yeah, in short, I think we're all on the same page. Thank you very much. You did a great job in the quizzes and that's it for me. Thank you, Melinda. And a round of applause to that very, very informative and fun speech. Um, I have to say, Melinda, whenever I hear 20 story points, I run away. I challenge them. I wouldn't want 20 story points to do. But anyway, congratulations and um, good luck on Higher Up's journey to, uh, to make a difference to all of us. On that note, um, I want to open up the floor to anyone who wants to ask a question. And we've got a few minutes left. And I'm sure if you want to pop that in the chat or open up, uh, unmute yourself and ask Melinda a question. Over to you guys. Silence. Looks like they're all having their lunch the moment. All right. Going once, twice. No question in the chat. No one's still calculating how many story points they want to consume. Um, all right. We might leave it there. Um, and once again, thank you very much, Melinda, um, for sharing with us um, an insight into what Higher Up's doing and uh, that little game and, and a couple of your storytelling this afternoon. To take us home now, um, I have the great pleasure of introducing the Telstra Fab 4. But before I do that, I want to share with you some insights on Telstra, Telstra Ability, which is made up of a team of passionate Telstra champions who want to create a culture and a workplace where accessibility and disability is normalised. We want to be advocates and innovators who work together to attract diverse employees to join Telstra and to create a smooth and inclusive recruitment and onboarding process, empowering our managers and peers to disability, to be disability confident and ultimately become one of Australia's organisational leaders in the disability inclusivity. A big words for me to pronounce. Now today with the Telstra 4, I have the pleasure of introducing to you, um, in no particular order, we have Catherine Seal, who is a change manager turned agile coach with a long-standing interest in digital accessibility and inclusion. Um, she's part of the employee reference group on Telstra Ability. I also have the great pleasure of introducing Nick, Nikki Patusas, who is a certified agile coach in Scrum Master with extensive experience in industry. She is a person who lives with a category one disability and she's been a support and contributor to Telstra Ability for many years. This year she stepped up to take a lead role and uh, we look forward to some amazing work from there. Uh, followed by Brady, uh, Brady March, who is an agile coach with over 20 years experience in information technology. He is also part of the Telstra Ability Group. He has worked with a disability for his entire career and is passionate about advocating for people that need it and helping others to empower to advocate for themselves. And finally, we have Denise McTickus, I hope I pronounced that right. She is a member of the Telstra Ability Group as well as being accessibility champion at Telstra. Denise is a registered nurse and secondary school teacher. The Fab Four would like to present you with some amazing content and in the order you will hear will be Denise, Nikki, Brady. Um, oh, sorry, it'll be Catherine, Denise, Nikki, and Brady. So over to you, fantastic people. Thanks, Fred. Um, and thanks for that great introduction. And also thank you to the previous speakers and also to Jared for the um, welcome to country at the start. Um, we'd just like to add to Jared's welcome with an acknowledgement. Um, we're coming to you from um, Garingai country um, in New South Wales and also from w w Wurundjeri in Victoria. Um, and I'll just my notes, hang on a sec. Um, and um, we also wanted to give a particular acknowledgement for Aboriginal people with disability, as well as Aboriginal people who are carers and advocates for people with disability. 
Um, so what, by way of introduction, we really wanted to make this session reflective of the idea that the, um, the whole is greater than the sum of the parts. Um, so won't be detailing individual achievements or our disabilities um, um, or neurodiversities in this introduction. But I do want to say between the four of us and between the wider Telstra Ability team, we have an incredible range of lived experience of um, disability and neurodiversity. Um, we also have um, in our group, we have carers and allies and um, lots of Telstra employees who have a professional interest in accessibility and diversity and inclusion. So we just together make one awesome team and we're, you know, kicking goals all over the place. Um, so just as important, um, we have a range of, as our lived experiences. We also have a range of talents and skills that we bring to the table. As Fred mentioned, some of us are coaches. We've got a chapter lead. Um, one's a graduate and we all come from diverse professional backgrounds prior to our current roles. Um, what we all have in common is that we're passionate about inclusion and we're committed to making this talk today as accessible and as inclusive as possible. So aside from the captions, which you know we're proud to bring you today, um, we've also decided to ditch the PowerPoints and we'll audio describe any significant visuals that crop up. So if Brady starts turning cartwheels or anyone else does a sight gag, we'll make sure that we um, audio describe that so everybody knows what's going on. Um, and that will also be handy for anyone who's struggling to dial into the to the WebEx and see the visuals. Okay, so I'll kick off by quickly audio describing myself. Um, so I'm I have short dark hair, uh, which I think it's um, dark chocolate to be bittersweet chocolate to be precise. That was the description on the box. Um, I'm wearing glasses. I've got fair sort of Scottish Irish skin and freckles. I'm wearing a navy top and my background is one of the Telstra values. We make it simple. Um, the reason I chose this value is that it's my belief that accessibility and inclusion don't have to be massively complicated things to get right. Um, they don't happen by accident, that's true, but I think with a bit of goodwill, planning and ATP, that's the acronym that we'll introduce you to, it is not really that complicated. So just to explain ATP, this was something um, we got in, we love our acronyms at Telstra and this was courtesy of Amy Wally from Australian Network for Disability and it stands for Ask the Person. So, um, you know, what it, what it means, it just really reflects the idea that, you know, the expert in accessibility and inclusion is, is actual, actually the person who has the disability. Um, it also reflects the idea that di di disability is a very broad church. So, um, you know, it includes all sorts of degrees of disability, but also, you know, a great variety. So, you know, what we're learning through Telstability is that, um, you know, we, we're learning a lot, getting educated on each other's um, challenges as well as being able to share our own experiences. Um, it's also true that um, just because you know one person with a particular dis disability doesn't necessarily mean that, you um, you know, that you know everything about that. So, you know, someone who's got a hearing impairment might have different um, adjustment needs to someone who, someone else with the same, same disability. Um, so what I'd like to do now is hand over to Denise, who is going to set some context and speak about the why of inclusion. So over to you, Denise. Thanks everyone. Thank you, Catherine. So yes, I'm Denise Mardigas and I'll be talking about the benefits of a business that employs people that live with a disability or multiple disabilities, as well as giving you some stats about living with a disability relating to employment. And so first I'd like to tell you that I'm working from home in my lounge room. I have a desk with two monitors and a laptop. My background is a Telstra value show we care it's in the shadows of green with a with a logo um, and i've got long dark brown hair brown eyes and very much more rounder face post covid 19 lockdown 
Uh, I don't know if others can relate. <laughs> um, so one in five people in Australia have a disability. And that's one in three people have a disability or are close to someone who does. So that is could mean people that um, living with someone that has the disability. Again, being a carer, as Catherine mentioned, could be a friend, um, could mean a lot of things. 48% um, of working age people. So when I talk about working age people, I mean people aged from 15 to 64 years of age. They have a lower employment rate compared to 80% of those who do not have a disability. 41% um, of employed working age people with disability work part time compared with 32% that don't have a disability. So you can see that most people do clearly struggle to find work and can be unemployed for longer periods of time. And so something that's really, really close to me being a graduate is that graduates with a disability take 61.5% longer to gain full-time employment than other graduates. And so to me, that's a large discrepancy. It's very disheartening. I think about the time they, we spend at university or they spend at university working hard to gain their degree or masters and then finding closed doors to employment. They have the talent, they have the expertise required, but they have the obstacle of employers possibly thinking that it may cost too much money to employ people that live with a disability or or that they probably are not so productive, which is really unfortunate because we know we have the, they have the talent. So all these statistics are all backed up by research and there's plenty more. Uh, the links will be provided at the end if you're interested um, to find out a bit more. So the benefits to an organisation that employs people that live with a disability and treating them in a dignified, accessible and inclusive way. And I wanna point out dignified and accessible uh, an inclusive way. Aside from building uh, your reputation and brand, organisations that are seen to visibly and actively recognise and uphold the rights of people living with disability is consistent with agile principles and scrum pillars. And after all today, we, this is a scrum community. You would understand your customer base better, thereby mitigate risk. Uh, an added bonus is expanding your potential talent pool and retaining good people. Workplace adjustments cost absolutely nothing or close to nothing. Yet the benefit of employing people that live with disability includes improving retention of qualified employees, increasing workers' productivity, and eliminating the cost of training a new employee. We, all, we also know that when you have engaged employees, productivity increases. So that, so that does mean a, a company's bottom line is much better much, much better. So to me, that's workplace adjustments is just a no brainer. Um, and again, a huge error of a company that is not human centered or consumer centric means that they lose a big portion of the end user base affecting customers bottom line, because after all, as I mentioned, there is a good proportion of society that is uh, that does live with a disability. Um, because People with disability may avoid an organisation and dissuade others because of an organisation's negative diversity reputation. The fact that people with disability are often treated less favourably because of an organisation's negative diversity reputation, this also means it would I mean, I mean, affect their revenue and, and so forth. So this is why I'm happy, so happy and energised uh, to have this platform to talk about uh, disability and accessibility like Scrum Australia and to be able to show how important it is to include people that live with a disability. So thank you very much for listening to me. I'll hand over to Nikki Patusis now that will talk about what it means to be diverse, accessible and inclusive in the workplace. Thank you. Denise and hi everyone. My name's Nikki Petusis and as you can see, I've got a, another Telstra value behind me, which um, I adore, which is called We Are The Change Makers. And I believe when we are diverse and accessible and inclusive, that's when the change and magic really happens. I have the pleasure of working alongside some of the people on this call, as well as others in the industry. Um, and I'm one of the Telstra Ability Leads, which is a real honor. I'm here to share today about what does it mean to be diverse and accessible or an inclusive workplace. So when you think about accessibility as the concept of whether a product or service can be used by everyone and how they encounter it, 
In a work context, this means that will be provided, you know, people can be provided with means to participate, but without barriers and hurdles. These sorts of things could cover things like wheelchair access to your building um, through to making sure all your internal systems are able to be used equally by employees, such as captions or voice operated tech. If you break the word inclusive down and look at the first two, two letters, the IN in, you think about it, it means you're invited, you're involved, and you're being treated equally or given that equal access that may not be there. And remember, not all disabilities are visible, which is why inclusion has to be, you know, something that's so prevalent and important. Inclusion is actually the practice of ensuring all people feel that sense of belonging and that this means all people, regardless of their abilities, have the right to be respected and valued as members of teams and communities. Above all, they feel welcome and invi invited, but it makes it possible for you to be your authentic self and bring your whole self to work, which is something that's really important. So in a practical sense, inclusion could be, you know, creating an environment of safety where people can speak up about what they need, um, where people are included in casual social interactions, things like this. And it's a lot more than that, but one of the best ways to demonstrate it is to show you a video that we were really lucky that we got to make last year um, through Telstrability and Telstra for International Day for People with Disabilities. Um, Dave, would you be kind enough to play our Telstra video, please? Give me a moment, uh, going to start sharing my screen. Okay, just give me a moment. Okay, uh, confirm when you can see my screen. Actually, confirm. I need to again. Sorry, I need to put the audio, audio. on for that. It's all yeah. right, Dave, it's well worth the wait, hey? <laughs> it's a good one. Um, <laughs> got to make sure it's got the motion and video on there. So, all right, let's try it this time. Are we good to go? Yep, fire away. Sorry, Dave, are you sharing? Because it's not coming up. Okay, let me try that again. All right, um, can you see my screen now? Yes. Yep. Great, and tell me if you can't hear the audio. I'm going to click play. It should be fine. Thank you for telling me. Connect icon is clicked. Video calls oh, from good. live office workers appear on screen. How did I get my current job? Uh, I was headhunted. I applied for my job in a competitive recruitment process. I applied, went through the normal process as everyone else, and I won the actual role by being the best candidate. Do people with disability need an easy job? Absolutely not. I guess that depends on the people, but I'd say people without a disability might need easy jobs as well. A man messages different disabilities have their own challenges, so I'd say no. Depends how much work you're willing to put into the role. How should I work with you? As a human being, as a colleague, the same way you'd work with anyone else. With respect. And if you ask me what I need, I'll tell you. However you work best, I'll let you know if I'm struggling with anything. Should I jump in if I see you needing help with someone? Hey, don't forget not all disabilities are visible and it's just common courtesy to ask if someone needs help. Uh, I'd prefer that you asked because it's annoying when people assume that I can't do things. The man messages may be offer first or if they ask. Most people will try themselves before asking for help. Can I work to, to a deadline? Yes. What's the difference between being accessible and being inclusive? Accessibility is providing the person with the same user interaction as everyone else. But being inclusive means I invite you in, you're part of the crew. And that's what Telstra makes you feel like, that you're just part of the crew. Is there anything else that you want people to know? Yes, just because you can't see my disability doesn't mean it isn't real. People with disabilities are just people that operate slightly differently. 
The first golden rule with anyone with a disability, treat them a person first, the disability last. The white and purple Telstra logo appears on a mottled pink and orange background. Thanks, Dave. It's awesome. Um, I just want to make mention that the world we live in in Agile and Scrum plays such a pivotal role in inclusivity and diversity. Just remember the magic that we can help create by opening up um, opportunities and breaking down barriers. Um, I'm going to hand over to Brady March now, who's going to talk to you about what inclusivity means in an Agile organisation. Thanks for listening, everyone. Thank you, Nikki. That video was a lot of fun to film as well. I am um, I enjoyed being part of that. Um, hi, my name's Brady. I'm an Agile coach from Telstra. I bloke in his early 40s. I have long hair that you can't see at the moment. Um, and I'm wearing a big, thick woolly jumper because it's a cold day in Melbourne and I'm in the middle of getting my ducted heating replaced, which I probably should have done before the cold weather set in. Um, and I'm here to talk to you about what inclusion means in an agile organisation. So people often express concern around working in an agile team when working with a disability. But the agile principles and core values actually really strongly support tailoring your working environment and practices to help all members of the team operate at their best. If you consider the core value of individuals and interactions over processes and tools. It tells us to put the focus on making sure information is shared, not on how we share it. It's about finding the way or ways that work best for the team to make conversations valuable. Respond to change over following a plan empowers us to continually adjust the way we're working together, what supports we have around us, etc. It actively encourages to throw away the norms of workplace interaction and embrace changing the environment around us to better support the whole team. Remember, inspect and adapt doesn't only apply to the work we're doing it, but also to how we do it. When we think about our principles, people often make the mistake of thinking that the principle of the most efficient and effective method of covering of conveying information to and within a development team is face-to-face -face conversation. It means that stand-ups and sticky notes are the only way you're allowed to communicate in Agile. This principle actually says the opposite. If you consider against that, the principle of building projects around motivated individuals, giving them the environment and support they need and trusting them to get the job done. And at regular intervals, the team reflects on how to become a more effective, how, how to become more effective and then it tunes and adjusts its behavior accordingly. You start to see that Agile actually encourages every team at all levels to look at the how they work and adapt it to ensure they are doing things in the best way for them. Adjusting the way we engage with each other or what working environment we have around us is built in as, del as a deliberate and continuous part of Agile. So the next time you're setting up a team charter or running a retro, Take the time to consider the different needs of the team, how you can collectively change to support them. Make the team change customer focus, where the team is the customer. And remember, the person with the most experience in something is the person that lives with it every day. So I'm going to throw back to Catherine, and she's going to take us through some specific examples around this. Thanks, Catherine. Thanks, Brady. Um, so we do have, uh, I think we've still got a bit of time. So Brady did touch on how you can adapt agile practices to suit whoever you have in the team. Um, we have also put together a resource um, with some of the ideas um, that, you know, we've, in, we've used at Telstra, but also, you know, that we might have encountered at other organisations. Um, so we'll provide the link to that and what the idea of that is that it will be an interactive resource or a growing resource so you know people can contribute their ideas to that and we'll you know sort of keep that open until we have the actual session um, the workshop at the Scrum Australia conference in December um, 
and so some of the things that we'd like to talk about are um, or that we you know that we can talk more about are some onboarding um, tools that we've developed so one thing that um, the coach has developed early on was um, a checklist for scrum masters for welcoming new members to the team and that includes a bit of a conversation guide that you can have with a new team member um, and it covers things like just aims to normalize conversations around needs like adjustment needs so we don't actually you know sort of talk about you know getting people to declare or disclose their disability as um, a precondition for getting assistance but you know just talk about you know adjustment needs generally and that could be things like you know i need to you know leave at four o'clock to pick my child up from school or you know i need people to have their cameras on so that i can lip read or you know anything like that um, we've also put some other things in there so you know discussions of pronouns for example just to not normalize that conversation when you welcome a new member to a team um, so yeah so that was just one thing that we put in place to you know to help um, you know, just normalise these conversations when a new person joins the organisation. Um, another one which, um, Nikki, you might like to talk about is, you know, how we can use a social contract or charter to promote inclusion. Yeah, sure. So in the social charter, just building on what Catherine said, we've got um, areas where if people want to talk about um, things that they are able to do in the sense um, they're working, say, Monday to Thursday, that Friday is a non-work day. Again, we're just normalising the conversation, but the social contract is a great space to start the conversation, and it's all about creating that safety and what the team needs. So for someone like me who has a disability that isn't visible, I might ask that we use um, electronic um, post-it notes as opposed to physical post-it notes and that way I'm sharing with the team that this is going to work better for me. So it's opening up the dialogue and the conversation. Brady and Denise, feel free to chime in at any stage, by the way. Brady, did you have any experience with yourself as well in a social contract setting? Yeah, I did. Thanks, Nikki. I was just trying to come off mute again. Um, I, I've had experience in a couple of a couple of different times um both personally for my own needs and also back when i was scrummy for a team um and I, i'll talk about that one for it, it was something that i hadn't really thought of I, I was always very big on accessibility and inclusion but i maybe wasn't as aware as i should have been and our working space used to be a reasonable way away from um our project room where we had our wall set up and, and all that sort of thing it was close to a five minute walk it was a massive building and close to a five minute walk if you're a, a pretty quick walker like me and i was about two weeks in um after a particular team member had joined us she actually took me aside and asked if we could move the stand ups because she had mobility issues and it was taking her nearly 15 minutes just to get from her desk to where we were running stand up and then another 15 minutes back. So what was a 15 minute stand up for us? It was a 45 minute stand up for her. It was 45 minutes out of her day, just to get, get from her desk to stand up and back again. Um, so it was a, a really simple things like that. It doesn't, a, a, that change didn't have to be changing the way we operate as a team. It was literally just a case of being aware that maybe standing up in our desk area is gonna be more accessible for everyone than having to go and wander over to our project room. Um, and yeah, so looking at looking at all your ceremonies, looking at the way you're interacting, where you're interacting, uh, all that stuff, you you just want to be tailoring it to the individuals rather than rather than following a script that's been handed down. Yeah, thanks so Thank, much. Thank you very much everyone. Um, is there any more content to go guys? Um, I just we were just going to mention that you know the importance of creating a network of support. So um, you know, tell stability. I don't know if Denise wanted to say anything additional to close out on that, but I think you've all seen you know seen how we work today. Well done, everyone. Thank you, Catherine, Nikki, Brady, and Denise. Sorry, Fred. I have a question. Yes. 
Um, Please call out your questions. Thanks so much. Really appreciate the share, um, uh, especially the video. It really makes me proud to be one of part of Telstra. Um, wanted to know so if we were, as if I'm interested in seeing how I could contribute to, you know, whatever project you're working on right now. What's the best way to kind of offer my help? I suppose. Yeah. So um, we've got a um, so everyone at Telstra. Um, you know, we've got a Teams channel um, and we have a sync up once a month and we've, it's very organic. I mean, it's obviously everybody's, um, everyone's got a day job and this is something that we do in addition to our day job. So, um, you know, as well as being a support community, we, you know, get involved in initiatives like this and, you know, everyone is welcome to, everyone at Telstra is welcome to come along and contribute. So, um, you know, it's not, so Telstrability is for people with disabilities, but it's also for allies and carers and anyone else who has an interest in the space. So happy to add you, Shelvia. Thanks so much. You can find those lovely people in our internal uh, channels. So thank you very much for that. I believe we've got two questions from Dave. You want to call it uh, out, Dave? Uh, yeah, I, I might go next. Um, so I, I really learned about uh, ATP today. So thank you for that. Um, I've got a question for Melinda. Um, so Melinda, do you have any tips on building inclusive practices and, and also getting the right technology in place so people can work together? You know, that's why I loved your ATP. You know, it's just ask, just find out what, what somebody else needs and wants. It's just so important. I mean, obviously, you know, we have um, a fully accessible office from a physical disability standpoint, which really helps, you know, having um, for some of the people that I work with, just being able to have a, a, you know, obviously to have an accessible bathroom, those things, you know, are the, the beginning, you know, can you physically mm -hmm. access the building? But then it's about all the meetings, you know, do posted work or not work? Do, does virtual work or not work? It's like asking, mm -hmm. asking the person, you know, I mean, that's it. Just love it. Yeah, and sometimes you do have to thrash it out. So in Telstrability, obviously, we've got all sorts of disabilities. So what mm. might work for one person in Telstrability might not work for somebody else. And, you know, I think, you know, being able to have those conversations, mm. like don't treat disability as the elephant in the room mm. that you, that's an awkward topic to talk about. Um, so, yeah, so I have actually posted the link to the Trello board where we've got a few ideas, but, um, you know, welcome, welcome more. Yeah. And, um, you know, it's not, it's not a, an end state, I think, inclusion. It's something that we can always do better. Um, and, you know, we can always, like, we're going to make mistakes along the way, but we can always learn from those mistakes and, um, you know, just become better over time. Hey guys, I'm on Thank my you. mobile phone and I can't, uh, uh, use the chat to ask a question, so I just thought I might ask. <laughs> um, sure. So it's it kind of it's a it's a it's two sides of a coin question, and um, and it is if the first one is if if I was your fairy godmother, what's the one wish you would ask for when it comes to disability? And then secondly, on the other side is what do you think disability has done that it could have done better in in trying to create the awareness that you're talking to? We did actually run a workshop with our team and I'm just trying to remember, Nikki, what came out, but I think it was that people with disabilities, the, the biggest frustration was being underestimated um, and yeah, and just that don't fear, and this is probably reflective in the stats, the employment stats that people, employers and people in a business don't um, always appreciate what um, people with disability have to offer in the workplace and either don't employ them in the first place or don't challenge them or don't promote them. Um, so that's probably, you know, in terms of a fairy godmother wish. Um, in terms of what's been done well, um, does anyone else want to take that one? Ask, no, no, I was just going to add it. Done better. Sorry. No, no, you know what? One of the biggest things, and this gets mm. um, called out regularly, is see me, not my disability have a look at who I am and what I can do. And I'm going to give a very personal example here. Um, I have the, that amazing blue handicapped uh, parking permit 
and it's hilarious when I park in uh, any car park how how much abuse I get because people because they physically can't see my disability the judgment kicks in and the behaviour I'm seeing a few hands go up um, and it's really interesting because I think God if you if you looked and you saw I was using one hand to put all my shopping in the the car and you had the decency to ask do you need some help you know we don't get those stickers for nothing they're quite horrendous normally our accidents that get us there but in a work sense. Don't don't ask me what I can't do. Encourage me to see what I can do. And that ATP, just remember that because it's gold. And then, yeah, I'll throw it for someone else to the second. Very wise words there, Nikki. Um, and Martin, if you were my fairy godmother, I want an extra Tim Tam biscuit in a pack of 13. <laughs> <laughs> don't we all? Um, <laughs> So on that note, um, I know, Martin, you're on the line. Um, with a few minutes remaining in our session, I'd like you to uh, share with us any news or update on Scrum Australia. Yeah, I think um, like we're, we're, we're obviously coming out of the pandemic, but if always the fear of the third wave and vaccination levels aren't uh, as strong as they could be. And so we're, we're trying to determine when best to meet together physically. Um, being conscious of, of the fact that Agile Australia is just about to do so, um, so we're 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 feeling like it November December, and I think if when we do come back, I think we're going to be a bit more minimalistic rather than like big conference centres, etc. Because you know we we want to make sure that the risk that we're taking, and also I think people want to go back to basics. I don't think you know if someone's complaining about. You know, I didn't have you know enough. Uh, there was there wasn't honey to make my tea. I had to use sugar. I mean, I'm I'm going to be probably saying I'm not going to. We shouldn't be as worried about that. We should just be trying to get back together. So I think we're going to try. And it find was it. the vegans. The vegans were not happy with their menu. That was the main problem. And okay. every. Uh, well, we we'll let we we'll, we'll let it we we'll let it. I, I I mean I think we have to so we have to fulfil vegans. But I, I've got the honey the honey into the sugar one that kind of got me. But um, <laughs> what what I would say is that we're going to try and figure out a way that what, how we do it is going to be a bit more celebratory of coming back and probably uh, whatever parts of the past that we can kind of shrug off, we'll use as an excuse to do so. And I feel that you know the there's an, a great opportunity to kind of celebrate coming together in a way that was different than before. And um, so we're thinking about November, December, thinking about where, what type of venue. And the other thing that I, these lightning talks are going really well. And um, to see people like yourselves talk with passion and giving people an opportunity to, you know, to understand that a lightning talk introduces you to a concept and maybe learning more about it is that you're interested in. So I would like to uh, work, and we also are realizing the you know the level of passion in doing them is uh, we've got plenty of um, interest. So what I would like us to also consider is that is there anybody who started to feel like they would like to present on a topic, and um, who were not part of the originally the reason we were doing this was because um, people who. And were accepted, and this was a dependency on them submitting for a CTC or a CEC. We wanted to give them the, you know, the credits that they were looking for. But if there's anybody out there that would love to start um, talking on any topic that wasn't part of a submission process for a conference 18 months ago, you know, just reach out. We'd we'd love to hear from you. And there's and things changed over 18 months, so we were, you know, we 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 want to adapt with it. So just reach out. And just ask, and we'll just set, try and figure out when, uh, rather awesome. than not. Thank you, Martin. As you know me, I love a celebration or two, so I'll be there with bells on if the invitation yeah. is in the mail. So looking forward to that, everyone. Uh, hey, we're I heard you're you sponsoring the beer. I am sponsoring the beer. It's kind of come out of my, my good mate, Andy. You know, Andy? Andy and I are that, but that close. Anyway, so we're about to close on 2 o'clock, and thank you for staying and being patient with us. Um, I just want to give a good plug out to the next session, session three of our Lightning Talk. It will be happening on the 21st of June, 2021, and we have three amazing speakers, Renee Craven, Sam Bartel, Santosh Newpain, I hope I pronounced that properly. Um, get involved, sign up, go to scrum.com.org. See yeah. you in June. Goodbye, everyone. Thank you. Thank you, guys. Great, great talks.
Thanks all. Keep safe. Have a and keep agile. <laughs> Thanks all. Bye. Thanks everybody. <laughs> Bye.